Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for um, speaking to us clearly. Thank you that we don't have to wonder what you're like. We don't have to try to figure it out. But you speak plainly to us in your word. And you've sent us the Holy Spirit to shine a flashlight into our minds so that we can see and understand who we are and more importantly who you are and how you've made a way for us to be brought back into a relationship with you. And so Lord, we just pray that you will meet with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. We are nearing the end of our sermon series on the sword of the Spirit. And so today we're, we're getting toward the end of that comma. And if you remember what comma stands for, um, the C stands for context. Look for the context. The O stands for observation. Make observations. Ask questions of the text, the scripture. M, the first M, meaning. What does it mean? Uh, how should I understand this? Uh, the second M is the main idea, which is where we look and see what is the center of the circle, right? What is God actually communicating to us through this word? What is the main thing he's communicating to us through this word? And then last is A. And the A stands for what? Application, right? Application is where the rubber meets the road. Application is where we take the word that God has given to us and we apply it to our lives, right? Where we actually say, how am I going to apply this word that I have to my life? And so the question for today was, how do I know if my faith or if someone else's faith is authentic? How do we know? How do I know if my faith or if someone's faith is authentic? And it might be tempting at first to say, well, there's no way to know. But that's not true. There, there is a way to know. And the Lord has given us an answer today in, in our scripture, which we will get to in just a moment. When I was in eighth grade, I got to go on a trip to New York City. Who's been to New York City? As an eighth grader, New York was just unbelievably massive. And as I went as an adult, it was still unbelievably massive, like on an even greater scale. And one of the things I loved about New York was getting to walk down the street. And um, they told us that we could buy things really cheap in New York that you could get amazing things on the street, like street vendors would be there, they would come up to you and say, hey, you wanna buy this? And I was, I was eighth grade, okay, keep that in mind, I was eighth grade, and I'm looking at a street vendor and he has all of these really expensive watches. I mean, Rolex, he had a tag Hoyer, he had all these amazing gold watches, and I was awestruck by these watches, and I was like, I'm gonna get me one of these watches. How much are they? And he said, 50 bucks. And I'm like, I don't, I don't have 50 bucks. And he said, okay, 20 bucks. And I'm like, this is a $2,000 watch for 20 bucks. You have got to be kidding me. And so what did I do? Handed over 20 bucks, got the watch, the ta I got a, a tag watch, and it was awesome. And I, and I wore that thing proudly. About a week later, about a week later, I noticed that my wrist was turning green. I noticed that my wrist was turning green. Why? Because it was a fake, obviously, right? And not only that, but the gold plating was apparently just some kind of paint, right? And so it was wearing off underneath, and the, the cheap metal that it was made out of was reacting with my skin, causing my skin to turn green. This watch on the outside looked amazing. But the truth is, it was not well built. The truth is, it didn't have a real solid foundation. So how do you know if a watch is authentic? Well, unless you're an expert, you have to buy it and try it, right? And you find out sooner or later that it's not real. Hurricane season is coming. And so, uh, you know, for South Carolinians, that means watching the Weather Channel. It means paying attention to what's happening out in the Atlantic. 
And sometimes when we hear that a storm is coming, I'll notice that people will run out and buy sandbags, and they'll run out and buy uh, plywood, right, and, and put the plywood over their windows and, and try to bulk up the house that, that was built, that they're, that they're living in. They'll do whatever they can to bulk it up, to make it better, to make it stronger. But how do you know that your house can withstand floods? How do you know that your house can withstand high winds? You don't really know, do you, until the storm hits. Then you know if it's well built. Then you know if it can withstand high winds. It must be tested. So let's talk about your life. Let's talk about my life. How do we know if our faith is genuine? I think the answer is really found in how do we respond to trials? How do we respond to difficulties when they come into our lives? That is really, I think, when we get to see what we're made of, so to speak. That's when we really get to see, is this metal authentic? That's when we get to see what kind of house do we have, right? How do we respond to trials? You know, sometimes it's the little trials that really get me. <laughs> like, like when I'm going down the interstate and some idiot is in the left lane going slow. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and sometimes it's those little trials that make, you, that make you want to just curse under your breath, right? Or maybe not under your breath, <laughs> right? Maybe out loud. Like when, you, when those little trials happen, sometimes to me it's like someone takes the parking spot in front of me. Have y'all heard of road rage? Okay, road rage is a response to a small trial that reveals what you're really made of. It reveals what you're really made of. Made of. How do you know if your faith is authentic? It has to be tested. Uh, Jesus, when he came, we've, we've been singing about Jesus, right, this morning. And when he came uh, to the earth, he was incarnate, meaning uh, he was eternally God and he took on our humanity. That means he took on everything that it means to be human. And the Bible says that he, uh, he placed himself under the law. And so that means that everything that God requires of us, Jesus took it on. Right? Uh, every uh, right response to, to a bad situation, every right response to a trial, Jesus took that on. And, and in one of his most famous sermons, uh, which we, we call the Sermon on the Mount, he, he talks about life, and he talks about what God requires, and he talks about uh, faith, and he talks about obedience, and, and he covers millions of topics, not millions, but here's some of the topics that Jesus actually talks about, and you can go back and read this in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, okay, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, if you want to read the whole thing, you can read it in 10 minutes, shortest sermon ever, okay, but in fairness, that was probably his sermon notes, just, just in fairness, okay, so, um, so, so Jesus, he talks about humility, he talks about anger. He talks about lust and adultery. He talks about divorce. He talks about loving people, loving your neighbor, even loving your worst enemy. This high calling of God's love that God would even love his enemies. And Jesus says that's what we're to do, love our enemies. He talks about helping those in need without blasting a trumpet. Right? Like doing the good work without having to be recognized for it. A high calling of humility and service. Jesus talks about prayer and fasting. About devotion to God in those quiet moments when nobody else sees you. What's your relationship like with God? He talks about money. He talks about how money can rule our lives and rule our hearts. And we need to turn away from trusting money to trusting God. He talks about anxiety and casting our cares on the Father. He talks about self-righteousness. He talks about faith and having a fruitful life. And then he concludes this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, with these words. And this is our scripture today, so I want you to open up to it and, and, and look, look with me. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 27. Uh, Latifia read it already this morning. We're going to read it again. You got it? 
Matthew 7, beginning at verse 21. Not Jesus has already given all of this stuff, right? All of this high calling of God's of what it means to live a life of faith and obedience. Right? And then he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He says, On that day, what day? The day of judgment. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. Then he said this, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. This is God's word. Lord, help us to understand. What does Jesus want us to know here? What is he, what is he getting to at the end of his sermon? He's getting to application. He's getting to application. He's saying, now, I've given you this long list of what is required. I've given you this long list of what the life that God wants for us is like. The life of the kingdom, the life of faith, the life of obedience, the life of trusting God with everything. And then he concludes it with these words. And he says, be careful. I've given you a lot of good instruction, Jesus says. Be careful. How should I respond to this sermon? Jesus says, be careful. The first thing he wants you to know is that everyone is building a house. All right? Everyone is building a house. Look around. Everyone in here, including me, is building a house. Every one of us is striving to live right. Every one of us is striving to live to be acceptable to God in some way, right? We're all building a house. We've all got a hammer in our hand, and every decision that we make is another brick in the house that we're building, right? Every decision that we make is another nail in the house that we're building. The big decisions, the small decisions, the successes, the failures, all of it is building a house. That's the first thing Jesus wants us to know here is that there's only two types of people, right? And they're both doing what? Building a house, right? They're both building a house. And Jesus hits us with that, and he says, look at the houses. If you look at the two houses, they might look exactly what? The same. Just like I was looking at that tag watch, and to my untrained eye, it looked exactly the same as the $2,000 watch. The $20 watch and the $2,000 watch looked exactly the same. The house that will withstand the wind and the house that will not could look on the outside, exactly the same. Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. He's, he's speaking to us, y'all. He's not, he's not talking about uh, people who don't go to church. He's not, he's not talking about people who are out there. He's talking to us, and he's saying, everyone, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He's saying you could have the right theology because to call Jesus Lord is 100% correct, right? He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so, and so, so to call him Lord, Lord is 100% right. Now, some people don't do that, right? Some people curse Jesus. That's not who he's talking about. Here. He's saying even some who say Lord, Lord, they have the right theology, right, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And then he takes it a step further, and he says, not everyone who prophesies, who casts out demons, who, do, who does mighty works, not everyone who comes early to church and sets up sound equipment, not everyone who comes early to church and puts out the coffee, not everyone who comes to church and helps with the sound or leads music or plays drums or, does, or, or comes and, bees, and, and is a model, a model citizen, so to speak, of the kingdom of heaven. He says, not even everyone who does the right spiritual thing. Not even everyone who does ministry will see the kingdom of heaven. Everyone's building a house, and they look the same. The right beliefs, right? The right doctrines, the right theology, the right look, the right practices, Uh, taking boxes to your neighbors with food in it. They're both doing that. They're both doing that. And Jesus says, not everyone. Not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven. So what's missing? What's the difference between the two houses? What's the difference? He gets to it in verse 24. Let's look at it. In verse 24, he says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man who built his house on the rock. Will be like the man who built his house on the rock. This is the test of genuine faith. It's not that you lived right. It's, is your house built on the rock? That is the only difference between these two houses, isn't it? One is built on what? The sand, and one is built on the rock. That is, they they look the same. It is more than having right theology. It is more than having good uh, spiritual practices. It is more than outward obedience. What it really comes down to is where is your house built Where is your house built? The first thing Jesus wants us to recognize is that everyone's building a house. The second thing he wants us to know is this, a storm is coming. And when a storm is coming, it's not about did you use the right tools to build your house? It's not about did you have the right skill? Does your house look you know, excellent. It's not about the quality of the materials of the house. It's not about putting up extra things to try to make sure it doesn't, right? It's not about, oh, if I'm going to face judgment, I better, better make sure I do some more good things, right? Because that's like putting plywood on a house that's not well built. That's like putting sandbags around a house that's not well built. When the storm comes, it's going to prove to not be well built, even if it has plywood on the windows, even if it has sandbags around it, right? And and so what's the difference? The difference isn't what we bring to the table. The difference is where is your house? What's the foundation of your house? And, 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 And if I could draw the connection, it's what is the foundation of your life? What is the foundation of what you're building Jesus says, my kingdom is not something that you can just add to your life because you need some self-improvement. Jesus says, Christianity is not about getting better. It's not about working your way to your best life. Right? That's not what it's about because there are some very fine-looking Muslims whose lives are put together There are some very fine, secular, non-religious folk who live good lives, who feed the hungry and put Christians to shame for their good lives. They got a three-story house, but it's built on a bad foundation. And when the storms come, when the trials come, that's when we get to really see what we're building our lives on top of. That's when we really get to see as Jesus says, am I really doing the works that he's called me to? Am I really doing it when the storm comes? 
Because you can pretend to be a Christian all day long, and when the trial comes, we see who you really are, right? It's hypocrisy. That's the word for it, right? And so churches are full of hypocrites. And to some degree, we are all hypocritical, right? Because I just admitted to you earlier that I don't live on the foundation that I'm planted my life on all the time. I don't always live on it, and I see it when stuff happens, right? I see it when somebody cuts me off. Jesus says, he ends his Sermon on the Mount, and he, and he, wants us, he doesn't want to leave us thinking, I can do it. It's, it's a long list of ethical teaching, good, good things. And he's, he's saying, look, don't think that you can just build your house on any foundation. If you want to live the life that God has created you for, awesome, do it on the rock. Build it on the rock, because that is what makes a difference. You know, your life can be good, but it will not withstand the trials, and it will not withstand judgment. It might stand through a lot, but it will not withstand the ultimate storm, which is coming for each of us. We all have to bear in mind that the lives that we think we live as Christians are not about our goodness. They're not about what we put into it. It's about where we planted because at judgment, it's not going to be, Gary, how good did you do? Uh, did you have a balcony? Right? Like, did you get a fresh coat of paint on your life, Marcia? That's not going to be the question. It's going to be, did you perfectly obey my will? And you're going to say, no, <laughs> I did not. I fell far short, but... I built my life on one who did. I built my life on a, on a solid rock. And his name is Jesus. Lord, I did not do it. Lord, I did not keep your commands. My house looked like a shack compared to some other religious people that I know. And I blew it more times than I like to admit. But you know what faith is? that even despite the way it looks sometimes, your life is planted on Jesus. And it is His human life. Jesus had to become flesh. He had to live among us because He had to take our place. He couldn't take our place if He didn't come and take on this stuff. He had to live in this mess. God lived in this mess that you and I do. He got cut off, right, literally. He got cut off when they falsely accused him, when they put him on a cross, when they tortured him and abused him and nailed him to that tree, he got cut off and what did he do? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He loved us to the very end. A storm is coming. But if you are in Christ, you have a solid foundation. And, and look, it's not just about judgment, right? It's about every day. It's, and this is, where, this is where we apply God's Word, right? We, we apply it by putting, by, by putting our roots down deep into this solid rock. Putting our feet firmly on what Jesus has already done so that we can build from that a grateful, grateful life, a life of, Lord, I don't understand why you, why you tell me that I need to love my neighbor who I don't like, but because you loved me, I'm going to love my neighbor. You see how that works? That's different than saying, I love my neighbor. Look what I did, God. It's different. It looks the same. It's different. It's different to say, God, I don't want to love my neighbor. <laughs> and this is like literal for some of us, right? I, I don't want to love my neighbor, but God, you've loved me. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love my neighbor. Lord, help me to love my neighbor. See how faith activates, how it, how it, how it helps us to move into application, to actually live that life. You know, I know some of you are going through financial hardship right now. 
And some preachers would get up here and they would say, you just need to believe God and he's going to take you out of that financial hardship. That is never promised in the Bible. Those are lying lips from preachers who ought to be preaching the message of Christ. And I will say it. But for the grace of God go we, right? But I know some of you are facing financial hardships right now. And it might be tempting because of that trial for you to say, I've got to steal. God wouldn't put me in this situation uh, with no way out. I've got to to take from my neighbor so that I can eat. I've got to cut some corners at work because I've got to keep my job. I've got to lie about my hours because I need to make a little more. You see how the trial of financial hardship can reveal your foundation and mine? It reveals it, right? And what do we do as Christians? We say, no, my life is built on Christ, and so I'm going to trust him, right, that he's going to take care of me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want And so the application in the real life situation is, I'm not going to steal, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to cheat on my taxes, I'm going to trust you. Right? And so obedience is not a way to get to God, it's a way to express that God has given you everything. Right? Obedience is about responding to God's grace in your life. It's about being transformed in the renewing of your mind and your heart and your your deeds. And the whole person to respond to him like that. Every thought, every word, every action flows from a transformed life that is grounded and rooted in Christ. Can I give you one more example? (laughs) How do you respond to stress? When I'm stressed, I eat. (laughs) When I'm stressed, I go to the cupboard and get out the cupboard? Is it the cupboard? Can we call it that? Okay. <laughs> like, I don't know where that word came from. But I go to the, the pantry and I pull out cereal and I pour a big bowl, a big bowl of If y'all have seen my bowls, I got big bowls at the Sibley house, right? I pour a big bowl of cereal. Why? Because I'm anxious. Why? Because I'm stressed. Why? Because I'm overwhelmed and I just want to make it go away. And so I eat cereal. Some of you smoke cigarettes for the same reason. Some of you drink alcohol for the same reason. Some of you go uh, to uh, physical intimacy for the same reason. Some of, we all have our drug of choice, right? But in that moment, what are we doing? We're we're on sandy foundation, y'all. We're on sandy foundation. And the storm of stress is revealing where our lives are truly planted. And what God wants us to do instead of that when I feel that temptation to go to the cereal bowl or to go to the cigarette or to go to, I'm not saying these things are wrong in themselves, right? Food is good. But it's not good when I go to it for comfort. Who do I go to? I go to Jesus. And I say, Lord, I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling weary. I, I need to just rest in you right now. This is where spirituality makes a difference when the storms come. And it might be a little storm, right? It might be a 20 mile per hour wind. Or it might be a hurricane. And the Lord calls us to respond in faith, to be rooted and grounded and firm on the foundation of the solid rock. Every thought, every word, every action is not something that we're building for ourselves. Don't miss what, 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 what Jesus is saying to us. Everyone's building a house. Right? Everyone. And they look the same. And Jesus says, look, they're not, they, they might be the same on the outside, but what's the foundation? And so there's an invitation in this, y'all. There's an invitation because if you have gone through trials and you continually feel blown away by trials, there is an invitation to, to move, <laughs> Right? Move yourself. Move your faith from what you were trusting in. Move it to the solid rock. Move your faith to where it will not fail. 
And it will not only hold you in this life, it will hold you forever. That is the promise that Jesus has for us. Security forever in him, but only in him, only in the solid rock. It's time to move. For some of us, it's past time. And so I invite you to transfer your trust from yourself to your God who loves you, gave himself for you, and who promises you an eternal security in this life and beyond. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the good news. Lord, thank you that it is not up to us to impress you. It is, that is religion. That is fake. But Lord, what we want is to be authentic. And Lord, we know to be authentic, we have to be built on you. And so, Lord, I thank you that you came and lived this human life, that you, being born under the law, that you did it all, that you, that you loved perfectly. And, Lord, where we fail, forgive us. And, Lord, give us that assurance that if our lives are in you, if we trust in you, then we are forgiven, that we are righteous, that we are on a solid rock, And that whatever comes into our lives, we can withstand by faith in you. So Lord, please build us in that way. Build each person here today. And Lord, I pray for those who need to move. That you would wreck their lives. That you would wreck their lives. To show them how sandy their foundation is. And Lord, I do not pray this lightly because I don't want to pray for suffering for anyone. But Lord, I pray that you would draw people to move and to place their trust in you instead of themselves. Lord, thank you for doing that for me. Lord, thank you for moving me from myself to Jesus. Lord, do that in every life here, in every life in Orangeburg. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.